Priatelia, dámy a páni, ja mám takú milú povinnosť hneď teraz kraj vás privítať v mene organizátora, teda Výskumného ústavu detskej psychológie a patopsychológie na 26. ročníku tejto vedeckej konferencie Dieťa v ohrození. A ja si budem pomáhať mojim ťahákom, ktorý som si včera vyrobil. A hneď teda hovorím, že tento kongres, táto akcia sa koná pod záštitou Ministerstva školstva, vedy, výskumu a športu Slovenskej republiky s podporou Ministerstva vnútra Slovenskej republiky, Slovenského UNESCO v spolupráci s ďalšími odbornými partnermi. A hneď na úvod, keďže trošku meškáme, tak to tak sa budeme snažiť zosvižniť, ale nechcem preskočiť jeden bod a teda pozdraviť a privítať našich skvelých hostí. Pred malou chvíľkou som videl, ako pán veľvyslanec Izraela a jeho excelencia musel utekať, lebo naozaj už mal ďalšie strednutie, tak len zdravím pána Vápniho, ktorý tu bol a od rána tu čakal, ale musel už odísť. A ďalej by som veľmi rád pozdravil pani veľvyslankyňu pre UNESCO, pani Mariu Krásnohorskú, generálnu tajomničku Slovenského USK. Dobre, Janko, sme veľmi radi, že ste si našli čas. Dnes pani Soniu Hanzlovičovú poradcu ministerstva vnútra pre školstvo. Dobre, Janko. Zo štátneho periodického ústavu pani námestničku Katarínu Vladovú. Dobre, áno. Sú tu takisto zástupcovia veľvyslenstva z Nemecka. Neviem, by tu mali byť také dve dámy, takže pozdravujeme ich, môžeme ich zatieskať. A ja vlastne hneď takto na úvod chcem všetkých vás pozdraviť, čo ste prijali pozvanie na túto konferenciu, čo ste merali dlhú cestu. Dnes ste na naozaj takomto arktickom počasí, ale sme tu, tak sa veľmi teším. Viem, že tu je zo pár hostí nehovoriacich po slovensky. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm really happy and I'm, it's why it's same privilege to say welcome to Slovakia. Uh, for few of you, it's uh, after 23 years. So we're very happy to have you here. We do appreciate that. Priatelia, a v každom prípade, a dnes ten program je nabitý aj zajtra. Ten line-up je úžasný. Ja som sa pozeral, že naozaj veľké kapacity a, jednak tu budú prednášať, budú tu mať svoje workshopy, panelové diskusie, takže a, je to paráda, že sa takto vymeniate skúsenosti. A, kým teda vhúpneme do tej pracovnej časti, ešte teda dovolte mi za hostiteľa odozvať slovo pánovi doktorovi Petrovi Lukáčovi, riaditeľovi Výskumného ústavu detskej psychológie a patopsychológie. Vážené dámy, vážení páni, cení hostia. Dovolte ešte predtým, ako začnem, privítať ešte jedného vzácného hostia z tiech prvého tajomníka veľovyslanectva Českej ambasády na Slovensku, Bratislave. Takže dovolte mi, aby som vás v mene Výskumného ústavu detskej psychológie a patopsychológie srdečne privítal na 26. ročníku konferencie Dieťa v ohrození, ktorej cieľom je identifikovať sociálne, psychologické a zdravotné ohrozenia detí a rodín, navrhnúť riešenia problémov a optimalizácie podpory pre deti a rodiny. Teším sa veľkému záujmu z vašej strany, čo je prejavom záujmu aj dieťa, ktoré je v centre našej pozornosti, ktoré sa mnohokrát dostáva do náročných životných situácií a práve my, dospelí, mu máme podať pomocnú ruku. Hlavné témy vedeckej konferencie sme vybrali s vedomím potreby riešenia najaktuálnejších problémov detí, mládeže, rodín, škôl a celej spoločnosti. Auditóriu vedeckej konferencie predkládame do diskusie nasledujúce témy. Integrovaný systém poradenstva a prevencie v prospech podpory duševného zdravia detí a rodín v multidisciplinárnom kontexte, pohľad na psychologické, sociálne, právne a etické problémy detí a rodín v kríze, Význam prevencie pred závislosťami a ochrana duševného zdravia detí a rodín. A v neposlednom rade 
celospoločenský pertraktovaný problém inklúzie, tak sociálnej, ako aj vo vzdelávaní. Termín realizácie našej vedeckej konferencie je o to významnejší, že práve v tomto čase môžeme spoločne osláviť 60. výročie vzniku poradenského systému na Slovensku, s retrospektívou pripomenúť odkaz velikánov slovenskej psychológie pre dnešok, pre nás všetkých, pre budúcnosť. Rád by som spomenul prvého zakladateľa tých... založil v Bratislave prvú školskú psychologickú inštitúciu pod názvom Psychologická výchovná klinika. Zorazňoval potrebu starostlivosti o deti s rôznymi problémami, ako je neprospech porusnúčenia a správania, sociálnej adaptácie, emocionality a podobne. Docent Bažány už v roku 1964 sa významne podielal na založení samostatného vedeckého výskumného pracoviska a jeho zásluhou vznikol aj náš výskumný ústav detskej psychológie a patopsychológie v Bratislave. Náš ústav sa stal významnou inštitúciou, ktorá výskumná vzdelávania detí a mládeže na Slovensku. Metodicky sa podiela na usmerňovaní inštitúcií v systéme poradenstva a prevencie a podporovala rozvoj ľudských zdrojov. Jedným z posledných významných výsledkov výskumné ústavu detskej psychológie a patopsychológie je aj národný projekt Komplexný poradenský systém prevencie a ovplyňovania sociálno-patologických javov v školskom prostredí, ktorý zmodernizoval a naštartoval novú technológiu procesu poradenstva a prevencie v Slovenskej republike. V súčasnosti komplexnú psychologickú, špeciálnu pedagogickú, diagnostickú, výchovnú, poradenskú a preventívnu starostlivosť s deťom, najmä v oblasti optimalizácie ich osobnostného vzdelávacieho a profesíjného vývinu, starostlivosti o rozvoj nadania, eliminovania poruch psychického vývinu a poruch správania poskytujú Centra pedagogicko-psychologického poradenstva a prevencie, kde pôsobia odborní zamestnanci v rezorte školstva. Títo poskytujú diagnostiku, reedukáciu, psychoterapiu, stimulačné programy, poradenstvo a rehabilitáciu. Súčasťou poradenského systému je výchovný a kariérny poradca, školský psychológ a školský špeciálny pedagóg. Asistenti, ktorí vytvárajú platformu pre inkluzívne vzdelávanie. Charakteristikám inkluzívneho vzdelávania a výchovy patrí rovnaká šanca na vzdelávanie pre každého jednotlivca. Ak dieťa a jeho rodina prechádzajú problémami, je nevyhnutné podchytiť ich včas prostredníctvom poskytovania kvalitných, dodborných a poradenských preventívnych služieb. Systém VPAP čaká nová transformácia a je nevyhnutné vytvoriť efektívny a synergizujúci poradný systém. Systémová zmena je zameraná na priblíženie odbornej komplexnej starostlivosti dieťaťu a jeho rodine od narodenia až po prípravu na povolanie. Má za cieľ integrovať služby, zvýšiť ich kvalitu a dostupnosť pre všetky deti a ich rodiny v každom kraji, okrese, obci až po úroveň osád v Slovenskej republike. Aktuálne úlohy nášho ústavu v procese transformácie systému poradenstva a prevencie sú odborne a metodicky riadiť všetky zložky výchovného poradenstva a prevencie v rezorte školstva, podielať sa na tvorbe národných stratégií, koncepcií poradenstva a prevencie vzdelávania a výchovy, rozvíjať ľudské zdroje, poskytovať odborné vzdelávanie a supervíziu, zabezpečiť kvalitné realizácie aplikovaných výskumných aktivít, štandardizácia diagnostických nástrojov a aktualizácia slovenských noriem k testom, príprava a pilotné overovanie preventívnych, stimulačných a intervenčných programov, a garancia a podpora spolupráce všetkých zložiek systému poradenstva, 
a prevencie multidisciplinárnych tímov a medziresortnej spolupráce. Verím, že spoločným úsilím, vzájomnou spoluprácou sa nám podarí dosiahnuť kvalitný, integrovaný systém poradenstva a prevencie, ktorý bude pomáhať deťom, rodičom, pedagógom a celej spoločnosti. Verím, že na tejto vedeckej konferencii v konštruktívnych diskusiách dospejeme k návrhom riešenia zadefinovaných tém a problémov. Vážené dámy, vážení páni, milí hostia, želám vám veľa úspechov vo vašej odbornej práci, veľa inšpiratívnych námetov nového poznania a nových kontaktov z vedeckej konferencie Dieťa v ohrození. Želám vám, aby sa kvalitné duševné zdravie stalo prirodzenou súčasťou života nás všetkých. Ďakujem. A dovolte, aby som slovo odozdal pani Belvyslantyni Mári Krasnohorskej generálnej tajomničky Slovenského UNESCO. Ako z názvu organizácie vyplýva, nosnými piliermi UNESCO sú vzdelávanie, veda a kultúra. Jej portfólio je však oveľa širšie. Zahrňa programy obsahovo zamerané na výskum v najrôznejších vedeckých disciplínach, na komunikáciu a informácie, inovácie a kreativitu vo vede a technológiách, biosférické rezervácie, ekológiu, oceanografiu, šport a antidoping, programy sociálnej transformácie či dialogu medzi kultúrami, kultúrnej diverzity, kreativity v umení, dizajne, ochrany svetového dedičstva a pamiatok, ochrany žurnalistov a slobody vyjadrovania, informačné a komunikačné technológie, vytváranie vedomostných spoločností, rozširovanie kultúry mieru a boj proti násiliu, manažment prírodných zdrojov a ich udržateľnosť, ochrany vodných zdrojov, ale aj rovnoprávnosť a rodovú rovnosť, mládež v tom najširšom zmysle slova. V slovníku UNESCO sú rovnako frekventované slova diverzita, rozmanitosť, inakosť, ako inklúzia a dialog. UNESCO sa zrodilo z presvedčenia, že ľudstvo nájde nové spôsoby, ako budovať mier. Prostredníctvom solidarity, prostredníctvom rešpektu a vzájomného porozumenia, dodržiavaním ľudských práv a dôstojnosti, prostredníctvom vzdelávania, kultúry, vedy, komunikácie a informácií. Vynimočné kompetencie UNESCO v oblasti vzdelávania, vedy, kultúry, komunikácie a informácií využíva svetové spoločenstvo na realizáciu svojich veľkých nových cieľov, formulovaných Organizáciou spojených národov ako udržateľné rozvojové ciele, známe pod názvom Agenda 2030. Aj Slovenská republika pripravuje svoj národný program implementácie SDGs. Pre strategický cieľ 4, vzdelávanie, vzniká priestor na využitie expertízy UNESCO. Záujem implementovať programy UNESCO do slovenských školských osnov tlmočila v Paríži aj ministerka školstva Slovenskej republiky pani Martina Lubijová počas 39. konferencie UNESCO minulý mesiac. Prioritou v oblasti vzdelávania bude zaviesť do školských osnov predmety globálne občianstvo, udržateľný rozvoj, svetové dedičstvo. Potrebujeme posilniť vzdelávanie v oblasti ľudských práv s bezprecedentným celosvetovým prepojením v globálnej snahe pomôcť učiteľom i študentom v prenose informácií i hodnú od. Nová generálna riaditeľka UNESCO Odre Azule minulý mesiac vo svojom inauguračnom prejave povedala, poslaním UNESCO nie je len popísať, čo existuje, ale diskutovať o tom, čo by malo byť. Aké práva a hodnoty by sme mali v turbulenciách sveta chrániť? Aké nástroje musíme vytvoriť z oči v oči hlbokým sociálnym, morálnym a technickým zmenám sveta? Veľmi blízke témam vašej konferencie. Slovenská komisia UNESCO s potešením prijala výzvu na podporu 26. ročníka Medzinárodnej vedeckej konferencie Dieťa v ohrození, lebo ju považuje za mimoriadne dôležité podujatie v súlade so vznešenými cieľmi UNESCO. Ďakujeme, že touto mimoriadne profesionálnou konferenciou pomáhate šíriť hodnoty UNESCO 
na Slovensku. Úprimne želám konferencii úspešný priebeh. Za stolom sedí aj pán profesor Miroslav Zelina, odborný garant. Človek premyšľa, že čo by mal urobiť preto, aby jeho život bol produktívny, aby bol nejaký zmysluplný, aby sme zanechali nejakú stopu vo svojom prostredí. Tak uvažne človek, že čo má urobiť. Jedna z tých možností je skutočne pomôcť deťom, pomôcť ľuďom v tom, aby boli šťastnejší, aby boli múdrejší, ale aby toto sa dosiahlo, tak je jediná cesta. To je, aby človek sám pracoval na sebe, aby bol tak dobre vybavený, aby bol tak kapacitne, potenciálne pripravený, aby vedel pomôcť druhému človeku. My sme tu všetci vlastne na to, že keď si zoberiete ten názov človeku alebo dieťa vo ohrození, tak tie ohrozenia sú tu mnohostrané. Tie základné také kapitoly, na čo majú vlastne výskumnú ústavu robí, je napríklad prvý bod taký, je kognitívny vývin. Múdrosť dieťaťa, racionalita. Prečo už 20 rokov lihávame v písameraniach? Teraz najnovšie ešte aj v spolupráci. Čiže zase pre nás všetkých. Ako to urobiť? Čo urobiť, aby tie deti boli múdre? Aby boli kreatívne? Aby sa dokázali v živote uplatniť? Nedá mi nespomenúť, že vlastne na Slovensku už boli projektované štyri školské reformy. Ani jedna nebola dotiahnutá, urobená do konca. A možno aj v tom je pes zakopaný, že potom tie naše deti v týchto testoch medzinárodných zlyhávajú. Ale na to sme vlastne tu, aby sme hľadali riešenia, aby sme povedali, čo s tým. Druhou veľkou témou je potom inklúzia. Keď si predstavíte každý z vás, kde robíme, a keď si predstavím napríklad, ja neviem, akú dedinu nálepkovo, a vedľa je osada Green, kde sú Rómovia, a ako im pomôcť, čo s nimi urobiť, koľko máme pomaly 600 osad na Slovensku takéhoto druhu, a ako to urobiť, aby ten problém nenarastal, aby ten problém sa zmenšoval. Žiaľ Bohu, čísla, ktoré máme v dispozícii, ukazujú, že moc sa to nezlepšuje z hľadiska počtov, štatistík. Zoberme si napríklad počet klientov na poradniach, aj špeciálno pedagogických, aj psychologických. Zoberte si zhoršenie známky zo správania, naraz počtu detí v reedukačných zariadeniach, v LVS-kách, v kliečomnových komných sanatóriách, počet detí v detských domovoch. Pred pár týždňami hovorili o tom, že to sú všetko vlastne ohrozenia, to sú hrozby a my, našou úlohou by bolo hľadať, ako to urobiť, aby toho bolo menej. Samozrejme, nechcem tu mať dlhú prednášku, len upozorujem na niektoré z tých bodov, ktoré sú veľmi závažné a ktoré je nevyhnutné riešiť. Možno ešte jednu myšlienku. Viete, v posledných rokoch, možno 10, 15, 20 rokov, psychológovia, veľmi významní psychológovia, dokonca jeden z nich nositeľ Nobelovej ceny, sa zamýšľajú nad tým, že vlastne psychológia dlhé roky bola postavená na tom, že skúma patológiu. Aj preto sa volá vyskúmať sa psychológia patopsychológia. Skúmame si deti, ktoré sú zlé, ktoré sa zlé správajú, ktoré sú nervózne a tak ďalej a tak ďalej, majú ADHD. Ale v tých posledných rokoch, neviem, Martin Seligman, americký psychológ a mnoho ďalších, založili hnutie pozitívnej psychológie. Aj na Slovensku máme tu aj pani profesorku, ktorá je v tomto hnutí tiež činná. Tá otázka potom znie, ako tú patológiu nahradiť niečím, čo je pozitívne. Ako urobiť z detí šťastné deti, spokojné deti, deti v pohode, deti, ktoré by kooperovali, ktoré by sa tešili. Zase máme štatistické čísla, koľko deti chodí rado a nerado do školy, aj medzinárodné porovnanie, aj v čase. Nie sú tie čísla dobré. Takže táto, nahradiť patogenezu, salutogenezu, teda niečím, učiť ľudí byť šťastný, byť múdry, byť dobrým človekom. Tak ja prajem tomuto sedeniu aby vyprodukoval hodne produktívnych myšlenok. Aj sme našli riešenia, ako urobiť z tých detí skutočne dobré, múdre a krásne deti. Ďakujem. Dámy a páni, dobré náro. Dobré ráno. Tie direktor, tie koleg, ladies and gentlemen, I am very, very glad to be here after 23 years. Because we began at that time to cooperate with the new Center, International Center for Family Studies. And I was the director of the Institute of Early Childhood Research and Family Research in Munich. And we have, uh, I have grounded the, the family research in Germany and I have developed 
the new education plans for federal state, sta states during the last 15 years. I would like to address my, the topic of my presentation from two different perspectives, including the results of three family studies, and then giving an overview what is the needed reform within the education system if we want to achieve the aim that Professor Zelina said to strengthen the competences of the child, helping them to cope with risk situations. My preference is support the prevention. Investing in prevention. And I would like to show some aspects that can be, need, can be used in order to achieve this political, social, and psychological aim. I began with three studies. You have to, it is not my computer, and I have always problems to adapt me to the new computers, but I hope yes. OK. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank to the interpreter. He makes a wonderful work because I have, uh, I have understand what the speaker said this morning and I have to thank you very, very much helping me to, to communicate to the, with this audience. The first study is the Nebraska study. Till the middle of the 90s, we didn't know if parents influenced the development of the child because we didn't have longitudinal research, and we didn't have a concept, a sophisticated concept about parenthood. In the middle, exactly in the year 1996, I visited the conference at the Penn State College in the USA, and in this conference were presented the results for the Nebraska study that was a longitudinal study beginning in the in the year 1980, including 2,000 families, and the researchers collected data from both parents and from the oldest child of this family. And the children at that time were between seven and 18 years old. 15 years later, they presented the result of this study. The second that they did they have presented a resource-focused parenthood concept. And this concept introduced an understanding about families that is, uh, can you help me please to go from the one in the next? Uh, okay, okay. They have introduced a concept, what can we understand under parenthood? And they said that the parents uh, invest a lot of money for the development, for the education, for the life of the child. That's a financial capital. And then the parents help stimulate the development and the education of the child. And that is the human capital. And the third capital was the social capital defined by two different aspects, and it was the father-child or mother-child relationship, the quality of this relationship, and the quality of the relationship of the parents, the co-parenting relationship. You see that we have financial, structural, and processual processual aspects into this model, and they indicate that from all these aspects, the, the development of the child can be influenced. This, uh, the, the researcher uh, analyzed the data using the path analysis, and in the first step, they included the two capitals, the financial and the human capital in order to make a prognosis about the development of the child and in order to identify the influence of the parents 
and the ways, the mechanisms that transfer this influence. Doing that, the only thing that this data could uh, predict was the, the school career of the child. The, finan the financial capital and the human capital influence their career at school, the learning process. And that is the, uh, one uh, finding that PISA, five years later, has demonstrated. And in Germany, we have a very, very strong relationship between these aspects. But the interesting point is there is no direct relationship between these kinds of capitals and the development of the child. If you put the third capital, the social capital, into the, into the analysis, you find direct, direct relations between this capital and the development of the child. That means the parental influence is going through processes, through the quality of the relationship, and is moderating, that is very important, from the quality of partnership of the parts. If uh, you ask, what is the best gift for a child? There is only an answer, a good relationship of its parents. We identify where are the problems and where are the, what are the mechanisms that cause this transmission, that cause the good at the end. The authors wanted also to know if mothers and fathers have the same influence in the development of the child. And they find out that variables of the father are more important in order to make a prognosis about the school career of the child than the variables of the mother. The father is also relevant for uh, if the child later on as, as adult show psychological problems. There is a strong relationship between the parental variables and the psychological problems later on. You know that we had in the 60s of last century a very big discussion about juvenile delinquents. And at that time, uh, we didn't have research. But many, many colleagues implicated a relationship between the parents who they, are, they, they were not present because of the World War II and the delinquency of the, of the, in the juvenile, at the juvenile age. That is something that is very important because if you want to prevent, you have to have to introduce the father into the family system, to, to, to offer the father opportunities to take responsibility. We have about 157 longitudinal studies during the last 50 years on the topic of divorce. What are the influence of the divorce on the development of the child? One of them, of this five, or one of these five topics is the development of self-esteem. And you, this study also shows that the father is very relevant for the development of the self-esteem of the child. And these studies in the divorce area show that the most important dimension of the personality of the child that is influenced negatively is the self-esteem. So the self-esteem is the basis. Self-concept and self-esteem is the most important competence that we have to strengthen if we want that the child could be able to become an active, uh, to, to, to use active coping strategies and to, uh, to cope with uh, risk situations. The mothers are more important in the organization and the quality of relationships. And the fathers have, have their uh, not so an important uh, role, as you see here. And both parents are at the same, uh, the same way 
important for the development of the well-being of the child. Knowing this, this, uh, this uh, findings, findings, you can begin to rethink how to organize the, uh, the, the, the education at home in order to help the child to develop its own competencies. That is the end of my presentation today. I have, uh, as I said, I have founded uh, family research in Germany 32 years ago, and I have conducted, and initiated, and carried out a lot of studies, a few of them longitudinal studies. The one was focused on fatherhood. That is the role of the father in the family, uh, supported by the central government. And the reason was that uh, I have published two volumes, 1985, about the relationship between fathers and children in different uh, social and family forms. But looking at this uh, at that time, we also, we, all the researchers reported only the rate of participation of father at home, uh, how involved is the, par is the father into the family, and it was only a report about uh, the question, what are the fathers doing? But what we do is not depending from us, from our concepts, but it's also very highly depending from the conditions under which we have to do this, from the labor, for ideologies, and so on and so on. After my visit in the States, I have to rethink about this topic. And I have suggested to the German government to initiate a new research in this topic. And that is the only empirical study that we have, representative for the Republic. And I have focused not only on, the, on that that the fathers are doing at home, but also, and that's new, that was new, how they develop the subjective concept of fatherhood. Because if I found a difference between the subjective concept and that, that they can do, we have an individual conflict and we have a social and political problem. For that, my uh, assistant Beate Minzel and I developed a very good instrument how to assess this subjective concept. And we, this uh, concept differentiates between four different perspectives, deep dimensions, and they are all orthogonal, statistically. Orthogonal, that means they are independent. You can combine them to the different uh, configurations. That is the breadwinner. That is a classical role of the father. He earns the money. And the wife has to stay at home. The second is the social function of the father, to pay attention that the child can maintain itself facing others, to be open for problems and requests of the child. The third is the instrumental function, to teach the child knowledge, to give him, him education, to, to offer a, a house, and so on and so on. And the fourth dimension is uh, focusing on the readiness of the father to reduce uh, his involvement in the labor in order to be present at family. We have collected the data in four groups of fathers. The, third group, the first group were men with their women, married or not, who they didn't have a child. The second were fathers, men who would become fathers. We all thought that the most important dimension in the subjective concept of, of the fathers would be the breadwinner function. But the data speaks a totally different language. They show that the social function was the most important dimension in the concept of the fathers, following 
by the breadwinner and then by the instrumental function and putting career behind was relevant but not so important as the other three aspects. If you analyze the data later on, you find that the, the relationship between the amount, the number of the fathers who defines themselves as social fathers is 67% and those who define themselves as classical breadwinner, 33%. Two to, third, two to three parts. And the second is, this relationship didn't change between the four groups of fathers. The third most important, the men who were childless had developed the same concept. The question for me was, when? They do that. When the young men begin to develop these subjective concepts, I suppose in the juvenile time in which they built their first relationships with uh, women, no, it was wrong. They begin between, or they develop it between nine and 12 years. And that is the reason because it is so stubborn. The concept has been built. And it doesn't change in relation to the experience that these men became. We find out also the factors that uh, cause this uh, development and why a lot of fathers have accepted this social function as the dominant perspective of their concept. Two of many factors are very relevant. The own experience with the, with the father. If the father was authoritarian, uh, he didn't have a close and emotional supported relationship with his son. He, this son tend later on to become a social father, a different father that he had and is implementing a compensation model. But there is also men who had a father who was uh, emotional supporting, uh, helped them the son, uh, the, the, he was not authoritarian, but uh, a father with understanding and emotional uh, support the, for his son. This son cops the father. We have two different mechanisms that are helping the men to go this way. And the second is the quality of the relationship between him and his wife. That are the two main mechanisms. And you uh, can recognize many, many uh, families in which the father is uh, involved in the labor, uh, don't like to stay at home. Look at these variables and you find out what happens at home. And why is that so important to understand the subjective concept? We have analyzed the data in order to find out what causes problems with the family. And one of these uh, problems is, who is the, how is the well-being of the father assessing it at the scale of depression? What causes the quality of the relationship between him and his wife, and what is important in order to value his own wife. If the subjective concept of one father is an egalitarian, that means he includes the social function, and of course he has to work, but in this relationship, the social function is more important than the breadwinner. This man wants to have a, 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 a wife that also support or implement the same concept. The wife is not staying at home, but she, is, she combines work and family. If this combination, if his subjective concept find an implementation within 
the family system, the, the rates of depression are very different. I show you these results. You see here, uh, on the left, we have uh, the woman, that is the red part, that doesn't work, and we have the depression, that is the red one, that's going up. But if the woman is going to work, if she responds to his subjective concept, the depression is going significantly down. So, you can see it also in other uh, aspects of the life. Uh, and that is something that is uh, remaining in the next time stable. It doesn't change. So, if the wife uh, wants to stay at home, but the man has an egalitarian concept, this man doesn't value his wife. And we know that in this relationship, you find also the reasons of familial conflicts. I have uh, translated, transformed these uh, findings to a concept for the central government, that is the facets of fatherhood, and the central government has uh, developed a new policy about the men in the Republic. And also these results uh, have been used by the Constitutional Court in Germany in order to adopt the joint custody as the rule and giving to the fathers the same rights as the mothers in the terms in the topic of custody. The first perspective of my research was the most exciting because I focused on the family development. I have uh, initiated a study, a longitudinal study, focusing on transitions. The characteristic of the modern family is that the family has to cope with many, many transitions. Transition to parenthood, transition after the birth of the second child, or first and second child, transition uh, after divorce, and the men have to cope also with transitions. One of the most dangerous transitions of the men is the retirement. You have a very, very high rate of, morbid, of uh, mortality after retirement. I was interested to know what happens within these transitions. And I have collaborated with the University of California, Berkeley, and we have developed a concept that helps us to understand what happens, what are the mechanisms, and how to cope successfully with transitions. That is, for me, the most important point of interventions, because the family system is only open for intervention if the family is going through transitions. And if you know the mechanisms that regulate these transitions, you can help very, very concrete to this family. I did that uh, with uh, Berkeley for the transition to parenthood in the, in the intervention study, and then in the transition in the, to, the, to post-divorced family. We can today uh, identify the coping mechanism that every family can choose in order to, uh, to cope with divorce. And my colleague in the States, John Gottman, can make the prognosis of the further development of the family with variables that, is, that, uh, uh, that uh, he collects uh, weeks after the birth of the child, depending the physical abuse and depending the divorce. You can make a problems today if a couple will get divorced, because we know the mechanisms that moderate that. This study is the LBS family study, LBS because this bank gave us for 10 years the money to do that, 
and you don't find uh, very easy people to give you money for 10 years. And we have uh, included in the plan 175 families around the Republic. And I show you what happens within this transition in order to understand a little bit why these transitions are so important. And I use for that a, a gravure uh, made by Albrecht Thürer, uh, 1498, that is the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And you know, you can understand what, what is coming now. That's the apocalypse after the birth of the first or the second child, the apocalypse of coping with this transition. Looking at the system, you find that the first horseman is that the occupational equality of men and women breaks down. Looking at the data, in the time, in the beginning of the pregnancy, both men and women were involved in the labor. But after that, we have a total reorganization. Many, most of the women are staying at home and the men are going stronger into the labor, into the work. You can see it in other data. During the, before pregnancy, the women worked 29 hours a week and the men 33. But three years after the birth of the first child, this equality became inequality. And if you look at the, at the data after the second child, that is the family system is now seven years in this situation, doesn't, no changes are. The system is remaining stable in this traditional form. The, the wife at home and the man has to work. And after nine years, this, there is no change. The second horseman is an equal, 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 an equal distribution of income between men and women. Looking at the beginning, that is the income of the men and the income of the women, it is not absolutely equal, but something similar. But looking at, the, at these nine years, you see that this equality is became a big inequality. That is not only I don't have my money, it is a, qu a question of power within the system. This wife has now to go to the man asking him for money. The third horseman is the homework becomes the duty of the woman. Looking at the development, you see that uh, at the beginning, the men uh, had about 40%, the woman 60%, but it is uh, now, seven, uh, seven years later, it is uh, 67 to 30%. Out here, a tra traditionalism in the organization of the family system. And the host, the fourth and very important, the, marit the marital quality declines. We have assessed this quality very strong, with very strong instruments, and found that the communication after the birth of the first child is going down and down. The communication after the second child is, remains in the same level, in the same direction, it's going down. The tenderness and sexuality is going also absolutely down. And after the second child, the, uh, we have the same result. There is a difference between men and women in this uh, topic. The women are missing the quality and the men are missing the quantity. That's the point of difference estimating this thing. And that is, of course, the base to develop the conflicts. The conflicts are developing. And we have the same after the second child. And of course, 
the quality of the partnership is going down, uh, also in the second child, and the dissatisfaction, they are not satisfied in this given. 80% of the parents are going the, of the parents are going this direction. But in Germany, half of them go to the judge and they make the application for divorce, and the other half is remaining at home. And I wanted to know what makes the difference. Why, under the same conditions, a half of the family is going to the court, and the second half is, is uh, unified in conflict at home. <laughs> and uh, we found out what the reason is. Looking at the data, uh, the satisfaction of a woman is uh, less if he became most of the homework. But this woman, doesn't leave the, the, the husband. He remains home. But if this woman finds that uh, I have to clean the car of him, I have to do something that is at a good end, he respects, she doesn't respect me. I have to do things that are genuine his job. This can give the an other result. The conflict is strong, and this woman is not satisfied anymore, and can lose, can go away. But if this woman finds another interpretation, I have to clean his car, because it is his job, but we have tomorrow to, to, go, to, to, go holiday, to, to have holidays, he is involved today in the job. He has to be in this Bratislava for a lecture, and I do that. If he re-evaluates the same, the, the no problems were in this family. It is a question of evaluation. How I evaluate the same event? You can see it in different uh, uh, things. Uh, if one wife uh, collects half different negati uh, negative experiences with uh, her husband, she is not satisfied, but she is uh, staying home. If he come to the to the to the to the, to the, to the point that he has always time for his friends, but if I if I suggest we go together to the theater, we do something together. He, doesn't find time, it, he doesn't respect me. And the results are very strong, and that could be the situation in which the woman could say, I don't like to, to live with him. But if he finds another explanation, if he, she reevaluate the same, the, this uh, situation is there is no problems. And I thought the men, you know, are more simple models. And I wanted to know if the men are using the same mechanisms. And it is the case. I have asked the men, the men uh, if they are satisfied with the marital ex uh, experience. And uh, these men say, no, in the time it is not so exciting, it is not interesting the love is over, and so on, and so on. And then they find concrete things in order to express this dissatisfaction. One is the order at home. She cannot order. All the things are so, and I want to live in a house that is uh, in some situation, don't leave that, I don't like that. If she comes to the uh, evaluation, his wife can do that. The effect is stronger. But if this man came to another explanation, to discover that 
non-order is, is another kind of the organization of the world, the chaos theory. And understand that this woman has developed a very different competence. She can, she can find out, uh, items in this complexity more uh, efficient than he can. If, if he reevaluates the same, that is, the problem is over. She has no problems with this situation. The evaluation, the, the, the value, the respect is that, that can help to stay together, not the other variables. The strengthening the child's competencies must be the uh, direction for new education systems. And I have said that 15 years in Germany, I am responsible to reform the curriculum and to introduce new innovations in order to change the education system. That is a very complicated uh, process and uh, project. I would like to give only a few aspects of that. New findings of the developmental psychology. Let's uh, know that we have underestimated the learned competencies of the young children. They are more competent to learn. They have uh, the competence to participate actively at, complete, at complex learning processes very, very early. And the, and the education system changes the paradigm. We don't focus anymore on knowledge and the transmission of the knowledge, but on strengthening the competencies of the child on this from beginning. Doing so and accepting this position, we have to recognize that these competencies are developing very, very early. The first eight years. And it makes sense to support, to strengthen the competence in the time in which they are developing. And not later on to invest a lot of money and to have less success. The second argumentation is coming from the uh, empirical econometrical studies and Professor James Heckman has analyzed all the studies that are focusing on the question when the investment in the education system brings the highest profit. And the answer of this analysis is very clear. The highest profit is if we invest in the first five years of life. The investment at school is good enough but after that, the relationship is not strong between outcomes and investment. So, if we want to prevent, we have to invest in the first 10 years of the education of children. And we have to do that to change the implications and especially the theoretical approach of the education system. Looking back at the history, we have used different theories in order to understand development and to uh, legitimate the organization of learning processes. And nowadays, we have left most of these theories. All that you see in the, in the first three uh, points of the presentation are history. Nowadays, we use interactional theories, and these theories introduce a very different understanding of development and learning. And as consequence of that, we introduce a new didactic approach that is the co-construction. Co-construction means that the child and the teacher, the child and the parent co-construct together the generation of knowledge and, for, and especially the construction of meaning. You cannot construct meaning with, without interaction without discussion. And we know now from the report of the Ministry of Education of New Zealand that co-construction is the most efficient method if you want to strengthen competence of the child. 
preparing the child to face and to cope risk situations, the best way is to strengthen the competence of the child in the beginning. But nowadays we have another problem. You know that all these theories are focusing on interactions between human beings. But nowadays the human computer can document, analyzing, and giving support and feedback to the teacher and to the children. That means the first time in the history we have to include in the organization of learning processes, non-human elements. And for that, we don't have a theoretical approach. And that is the point of discussion at the moment, uh, to, to discuss about uh, connectivism, about uh, uh, social shape uh, uh, theories, about network theories, in order to understand what happens in this very complex situation with human beings and non-human beings. And that is the theories that now are on the discussion. My position in order to prepare the system to help the children to strengthen their competencies is the child is from the beginning an active learner embedded in social relations. It is constructing its own development, but not alone. This network of relations, of relations takes place at the real and at the virtual world. And I would suggest to include the virtual world stronger than we do, because the risks and the new risks are not only on the analogous, but new in the virtual world. Doing so, we have to reconceptualize the learning process, not as an individual centered, but as a social process. If we understand that, we have two new chances. If uh, learning is the result of interactions, of discussions, of discourses, we can influence this, this discussion. We, if I teach the teacher to ask right questions, I change the quality of interaction. It's the first time that we have achieved two things. The child and the teacher are actively involved in the organization of learning process. That means the first time we don't have passive partners in this concept. And the second is we have the key in the hand how to change the quality of education. And the second advantage is these interactions are, uh, take place in social and cultural contexts. And we know that different cultural contexts are causing also different qualities. And we have to learn to respect these differences. The director said this morning that we have to strengthen inclusion. Inclusion cannot be uh, implemented into, into the existing system because the system is focusing on competition. Co-construction and inter interactionistic theories open the system in order to recognize and to evaluate the differences. Co-construction invites each child to participate in this learning process, expressing its own ideas and concepts, discussing with others, and to find the solution, the answer, together with others. If we want to have an inclusive system, we have to change the theoretical approach and the methodological approach. Otherwise, we don't achieve this thing. We have divided in my concept, we have, uh, uh, we have defined the visions and the competencies of strong children, communicative media and digital competent children, children as active learners, researchers, and explorers, as creative and imaginative artists, and responsibly and value-oriented active children. And the competencies that I have introduced in my curricula are divided into, class, into four clusters. 
individual related competencies, competencies that help the children to participate, to take part uh, at the society, to co-construct the society, and to be responsible for that. And the two other clusters of the competencies, we didn't have it in uh, about 50 years ago. On, I had in my institute develop these metacognitive competencies and the competencies in dealing with change. And that is the competences that you need if you want to strengthen the competence of the child in order to cope with risk situations. Resiliency is today one of the key competences to know how to cope with this resiliency, with these situations. And the, we give to the teachers a very exact tableau of competencies, here the individual competencies, emotional competencies. One of the problems of young boys is that they, can lo they don't learn to cope with emotions. And that happens between three and seven years. If we don't focus on this area, if we don't help the child to develop the competencies, we cannot achieve the aim. And competence in the social context and strengthen resilience. And I come to the end, uh, underlying the importance of digital competence. Because many new risks, as I said, are in the virtual world. Not anymore in the analogous, but in the virtual. For that, we began in, at the international level to develop digital strategies for school how to transfer the school system to the digitalization. We have uh, different strategies around the world. They, many of them are very sophisticated. And we began to conceptualize the digital competence. Uh, in this topic, the uh, European Union has presented a few years ago a new concept with 21 competencies that are necessary in order to strengthen the digital competence of the child. You find these competencies here in this transparency. You don't uh, need to, to read or to, you can have the transparency if you want and to have uh, this, uh, this information. And then we extend the literacy also to the digital literacy. And that is a new thing. And we have also here concepts how to support the child to develop digital literacy. To do that, and that is the last point, we need an ecological approach, approach in the education systems to include all the learning areas outside of school because these learning areas are more important for the development of the competencies that the school can offer. That is a clear result. These learning areas outside are more and more important than the schools in order to strengthen competencies of the children. And, the, and if you want to do that, we need a new concept of, concept, uh, of uh, a new conceptualization of the partnership between these learning areas and especially, we know, since 50 years, that the most important learning place for the child remains the family. If you want to strengthen children, you have to focus on families, on the competency of the families. And we have a lot of monograms, monographs during the last time helping us to do that. We have projects like the fine project of the Harvard University, and we have a lot of studies, longitudinal studies, that offers these results. All these studies, beginning in Canada, and replicating these studies in uh, Australia, New Zealand, in France, in Scotland, in Ireland, came to the same result. Strengthening the competence of the parents, and you have competent children. And that is, I think, that uh, we have to do. And my suggestion for Bratislava is 
to as a learning place. What they do every day is an learning offers, offers learning opportunities. I did that in a concept that is translated now in several languages. Uh, early begin on the family as learning place. And I show very practical how to do that within the family in order to help the family to develop the competencies of its own child. That is the best way for prevention. Thank you very much. Za svojou kolegyňou budú potom aj, myslím, ak teda stihneme všetko dla tých časových plánov, tak o 14.30 máte pre vás taký workshop. Takže uh, doporučujem tento konkrétny, lebo naozaj uh, videl som nejaké slády z toho a vyzerá to veľmi zaujímavé. Takže, Kalin Erkin, mi sa páči. OK, so the microphone is yours. Thank you for inviting me here. Me and my colleague, Dr. Yonaf Weiss, are teaching professionals in Israel about the unique situation of gifted children. We use Gestalt concepts to understand the world and to work with them. I want to share with you my thoughts for my work with gifted children and talk about the cost of their gift. Many people think that gifted children are very lucky. Everything is easy for them. They are good students, no effort, excellent grades. Well, it is not that easy for most of them. The studying may be easy. The hard part is the other stuff. How do they manage the conflict when they wishing to glow, to express their knowledge, and they're wishing to stay part of the gang, to be accepted by their friends. In Israel, kids that are in the upper 3% on intelligent tests study once a week in a regional school, away from the regular school, where they have the opportunity once a week to study with other gifted children. Here is what they say in the gifted school about their experience in the regular class where usually they are the only gifted child in the classroom. How do I go backwards? Okay. Once I got 80 on a test and the teacher said, how come you got only 80? Maybe you shouldn't go to the gifted center after all. I was so ashamed. Once I tried to behave like the other kids. I didn't answer in class, even though I knew the answers. And everybody made fun of me and said, hmm, maybe you are not really gifted. How come you didn't know the answers? So we see that the experience is very complex. We also ask them in the gifted center many times to draw how do they experience their uh, being here in the special school or in the regular school. And here is one draw. This girl on the right drew her like a big bright red circle in the regular school where you can see she's in the middle She's bigger than the other ones, but she's different. She doesn't uh, know if they understand her all the time, and she just feels out of place, even though she's glowing in the center. In the gifted uh, class, she feels like everybody else. She is a red circle like every, everyone else. She, feel, uh, she feels understood, but you see she's paying a price, but because she's not glowing, she's not Unique, no, she's not on the spot. So what actually are the definition of gifted children and their main characteristics? 
We're talking about children with high ability to digest knowledge efficiently and quickly. We are talking about children with IQ above 135, although we know the limitation of this uh, um, definition because it measures mainly cognitive and focused uh, thoughts and not creative thinking. So we talk now also about asynchronous development, me meaning being out of sync, like for example, uh, being very high on cognitive ability and not so high on emotional or interpersonal abilities. And this gap can cause problems. We're talking about curiosity, about good memory, achievement oriented, most of them, we see that it's not all the time the case. Not obedient many times, stubborn, creative most of the time, and intense. And I want to talk a bit more about this intensity by um, mentioning a concept coined by a, a Polish psychiatrist and writer named Dabrowski. The concept is overexcitability. He found that in gifted children, uh, there, there is a special way in many of them to experience the world. Like it's not only cognitive uniqueness. He defined it as an innate predisposition of the nervous system to respond more intensely to life stimuli. This causes those with overexcitabilities to have more intense than usual experiences. Okay. Um, research shows a high correlation between giftedness and overexcitabilities. And Dabrowski was talking about five areas in your life that uh, you can experience the world this way. I want to mention that not only gifted kids or people have this um, overexcitability, it's about 10% of the population that experience the way this way. And maybe you can find yourself in one or more of them. So the areas are, the first one is emotional. We are talking about uh, children or adult who takes to heart very deeply feelings, emotion, for good and for bad. Like if uh, they see something bad that happened in the news, or uh, their pet get injured, or something bad happened, they'll take it very, very strongly, and uh, will find uh, that they have to talk about it a lot, and hard for them to forget about it and put it aside. We're taking, we talk, the second one is psychomotor. It's a bit similar to being hyperactive, but it's different. We're talking about the love of movement. We're talking about kids that uh, talk a lot, um, like to organize their, their surrounding, and especially likes to move even though, even while they're studying. So for example, in the gifted uh, center, we allow these kind of kids to walk while they are doing their uh, 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 work at uh, school. We allow them also to get out of the class and come back as uh, if we know they have this uh, special uh, experience. Third one is intellectual. <clears throat> I'm not talking here about the ability, but about the passion of knowledge and the passion to solve uh, hard problems, complex problems. Uh, these kids think a lot, have a, a tremendous amount of curiosity about intellectual issues. Like one kid told me, when I have a, a, a special a new book about a math a questions and the problems, I feel as if I have a birthday cake in the refrigerator. I'm so excited about it. First one is essential. We are talking about a very deep experience from the five senses. Like you see in the picture, this girl, when she's hearing a, a special uh, music, she feels so immersed in the situation and she feels so uh, deeply moved by this. The same for other senses. Like if you see a piece of art or a nature scene, you can be so moved by it and you can tell, you can, sometimes when you share it, when these kids share it, they are being blamed for uh, being overreactive, like people will tell them, 
So what? It's not such or such. Why are you making such a big deal of it? Okay? So they feel different. Last one is the imaginational. We are talking about uh, kids and adults with rich associations, rich imagination. They like to write stories about what they imagine will happen. Sometimes they get trouble in class because of that, because what the teachers say reminds them of something, and they go in their imagination, tell themselves stories about it, and lose the teacher's uh, attention. So we are saying that the road of the person with overexcitability is not a smooth or easy one. And that's for two main reasons. One is because it's like a roller coaster. You know, it's so intense, and it goes up and down, and it can be very tiring. The other one is because most people around you, if you have overexcitability, doesn't experience the world in this way. So you feel that you are out of sync with society. Like I said before, people may blame you a lot for overreacting and question the validity of your experience. But on the other hand, it can be very exciting. It makes the world uh, richer, livelier, and it can be a motivator to create things. I, I imagine that many of the artists, the poets, the, you know, and the so, so on, had or have some kind of overexcitability that they challenge into their artwork. So we can say that excitement is seen like exaggerated. High energy level is seen as hyperactivity. Persistent is seen as nagging. Asking question is seen as undermining authority. Imagination is seen as lack of attention. And uh, this brings me to, the, to name some of the stresses that special for gifted children. The first one, like I mentioned, is overexcitabilities. The second one is different interests than peers. Many gifted kids in very young age interest in things that their, their friends couldn't care less about, like philosoph philosophical issues, like gravity, like all kinds of things. Like one, one boy drew in the group we made for them, he drew this, he said, here is me and my gifted friend, and there is a huge, strong barrier, like a concrete wall between me and the rest of the class. Not only a concrete wall, he also put sandbags to make sure that he feels that he cannot reach the barrier between him and what interests the rest of the class. Another girl had this drawing, and what she told me when she drew it is like her, her mother uh, is a physician, and she told her on the weekend about genetic diseases. And the girl very enthusiastically went the next day and wanted to share it with her friends. And they got so scared and such a reaction to that, and that's how she felt. All these stresses. I thought that many of them uh, choose one uh, of two polar attitudes that both, as we are going to see, have a big price. First one is the overexpressing giftedness. These kids who are so uh, sure that their um, identity is because of their gifted. And the other one is the inhibited gifted kids who want to camouflage their giftedness. The first one, metaphorically, we can see as a girl that's going with a sign, I am gifted, because she's so scared that nobody, that not everybody will know that she's gifted. That's her right to be in the world. So self-expression is very crucial for her. The other one, metaphorically, we can see as a kid who is so, uh, it's so important for him to be part of the gang that he'll go with their kids. he just think about his special thoughts. He will not express them, okay, um, because he so much wants to be uh, accepted by his peers. As I said, both polar attitudes have price. Like the girl 
metaphorically, will be isolated because kids will not want to, um, to be with her because she puts them down a lot, she's showing off a lot. The, the boy that uh, playing with his kids will feel lonely many times. We know that you can feel lonely even when you are with other people, especially when you are alienated from yourself, a big part of what you are. So before I relate to this picture, I want to say about these two, um, uh, two polar attitudes that uh, the, the price that the girl with a sign is paying, uh, is she's going to be a uh, overachiever. She usually is going to restrain herself to prevent herself from attending a subject that she's not sure she's going to excel in. Because for her, not excelling is uh, something that she cannot allow herself. And the kid that uh, camouflage his giftedness many times uh, will be underachiever, uh, will camouflage his giftedness, will restrain himself a lot. So it's both have a price. Here's a, a last picture of a girl that um, drew herself that want to reach a, a high goal and not going uh, lay after her friends, but she, she uh, drew this black bird a symbol of uh, the other kids that don't allow her, prevent her in her feeling at least, to reach her higher goal, and maybe also it represents her own thoughts of how dangerous it is to reach uh, a higher goal. So actually, what we are doing in the and what we are teaching the uh, psychologists and the counselors that work with gifted children, we are helping them to balance between these two important poles, the wishing to glow, to express themselves and their uniqueness, and the wishing to stay connected, to be part of the group. We know this conflict is like existential conflict for all of us, but we find that for gifted children, it's especially hard. And uh, how, we help the, how do we help those kids and their teachers um, to maintain this conflict uh, from Gestalt perspective? We are going to um, experience more in depth in the workshop uh, with Dr. Yona Weiss and myself in the afternoon. So thank you very much. Váš americký kolega Willem Bernet vás pozdravuje a posiela vám jedno video trošku možno takej kontroverznej téme v zmysle toho, že to odlučenie rodičov od dieťaťa on to definuje ako syndrom, ale z medicínskeho hľadiska by to nemal byť syndrom, pretože vieme, ako sa definuje syndrom. A práve na túto tému tých rôznych uhov pohodu na vec, bude to video, ktoré si teraz pustíme. Hello, my name is Dr. William Burnett and I really appreciate this opportunity to participate in your meeting today in Bratislava. Let me introduce myself. I am a professor in the United States at Vanderbilt University and I'm uh, a professor in the field of child and adolescent psychiatry. And today we're going to be talking about the scientific basis of parental alienation. And I'll just mention that I've been interested in parental alienation for many years. And in fact, one of the things I did is I started an organization which is called the Parental Alienation Study Group, or the abbreviation PASG. We've grown over the last few years and we now have members of PASG from many countries, actually about 46 countries, we have members uh, of this organization, the Parental Alienation Study Group. And in fact, we have two members from Slovakia. Uh, one is Alna Dusakova, and the other one is Dr. Josef Tinka. And we're very happy to have those members from Slovakia. So today, uh, 
What I want to do is uh, tell you the definition, is to explain to you briefly what parental alienation is, and then I want to talk about the problem that we have, and that there are a number of people who, there are some people who don't like the idea of parental alienation, and they make statements, they make false statements about this concept. And that, I want to tell you about some of the false statements or the misinformation, the bad information that is uh, going around about parental alienation. So first of all, just to make sure we're talking about the same thing, I'll give you a brief definition, which is parental alienation refers to children, and usually the children uh, are a situation where their parents are engaged in a high conflict separation or divorce. And the child aligns himself with one parent, and we call that the preferred parent. And the child rejects the relationship with the other parent, we call the, the uh, target parent or the rejected parent or the alienated parent. And this is done without a good reason or without justification. In other words, in parental alienation, the target parent, the rejected parent, has not done anything to justify the rejection. But it's usually a good parent who previously had a good relationship with the child, but now uh, that relationship has failed. So when we see these cases of parental alienation, we usually talk about the level of severity. And is it mild, moderate, or severe? in terms of how serious is the case. So just, I'll tell you briefly how we define those terms. In mild parental alienation, the child says, I don't want to go see the other parent. Like, I don't want to go see dad. But the child goes to visit and does fine. In other words, once the child gets to the other parent's house, the child is fine. That's mild. In moderate cases of parental alienation, the child says, I don't want to go see the other parent, I don't want to go see dad. And when the child goes, there are difficulties. All during the uh, time of visitation, there are difficulties. And so the child is negative or oppositional. So that's moderate. In severe cases of parental alienation, the child says, I don't want to go, and doesn't go. There is no contact with the other parent. And so that can be very serious, and the child can be out of contact for a long time, for years, even months or years, and doesn't see the other parent. And that's a very serious mental condition. In other words, the child has the false belief that there's something wrong with the other parent. So that's almost like a delusion. The child has the false belief that the other parent is evil or dangerous or not worthy of being loved. And, uh, and the child then acts on that belief by refusing to see that parent. And that can create mental problems for the child both during childhood, but also later in life. Professional organizations. And that's not true at all. What, what is said about this condition is, is misinformation or fake news, as we call it sometimes. Because, in fact, parental alienation has been recognized and accepted by a number of professional organizations, at least I know in the United States, and to some degree in other countries. I'm just going to list some of these and tell you briefly about some of these organizations that have recognized parental alienation. Perhaps the first one is... Uh, the organization in the United States called the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And way back, 20 years ago, in 1997, they published a practice guideline for how to do a child custody evaluation. And in that document, there's a whole heading, there's a whole section that discusses parental alienation. There are many other organizations that have done this. There's one called the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts. And they have a similar document where they talk about parental alienation. There's a big organization that you probably have heard of, the American Psychological Association. They have a book. It's called the APA Handbook. 
to forensic psychology. And in that book, they have a chapter about child custody issues, and they have a section that talks about uh, parental alienation. In other words, these organizations have published documents and books that talk about this condition. There's a smaller organization in the United States called the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers that talks about this problem. And there's another organization called the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children that talks about parental alienation. It's also published in books. There is at least two encyclopedias that I know about that talk about, that have chapters on parental alienation. One is called the Encyclopedia of Forensic Science, and the other is called the Encyclopedia of Clinical Psychology. And they both have chapters on this topic. Well, perhaps most important is the publication of the World Health Organization that most mental health professionals in the world are familiar with, the ICD, which is the International Classification of Diseases, which I know is used in Slovakia. And the ICD is going to be published again, the new edition, in 2018, and it's going to be called ICD-11. And current alienation is not a separate diagnosis in ICD-11, but it will be uh, listed as an alternative as a, an alternative term. For instance, there is a diagnosis called caregiver child relationship problem, and it will be mentioned under that diagnosis other possible terms like parental alienation and parental estrangement. The similar thing in the United States where we use the DSM, which is called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and the DSM-5 came out a couple of years ago. So in that book, the word parent alienation is not there, but the concept is there. And in particular, there's a new diagnosis in DSM-5 called Child Affected by Parental Relationship Distress. And that diagnosis really is a paraphrase, or it refers to parental alienation. There are other organizations in other countries that have adopted this term. And one that I know about is in Italy. And in that country, there's an organization for child psychiatrists and child neurologists. And they've published a paper on child abuse or a guideline on child abuse. And that document talks about parental alienation, just as we know it. This has come up in many, many courts in the United States in what we found about 500 cases uh, in, in the last uh, 30 years have referred to parental alienation. And also in other countries, for instance, in France, even the Supreme Court of France had a case in which they recognized parental alienation. And even in the European Court of Human Rights has, has, has cases about parental alienation. And some countries have even passed laws saying that parental alienation is a form of child abuse. For instance, Brazil and in Mexico organizations, because it has in many countries. The second thing about false information is that some people say that parental alienation has not been published in journals, and especially in peer-reviewed journals, but it really has. And uh, I guess I could explain the difference. What we're talking here is qualitative research. Qualitative research is descriptive in that it describes cases or sometimes many cases in which a given condition like parental alienation is described in a, in a published article in a journal. Uh, there have been a whole series of these and Going back in the United States in the 1980s, this happened in uh, a number of different publications by different authors all at the same time. And I'll just mention some of their names. There was a sort of sociologist named Judith Wallerstein, a child psychiatrist named Richard Gardner, a social worker named Leona Kapetsky, uh, another uh, social worker and sociologist named Clower, Stanley Clower, and Gwen Rivlin, uh, another psychologist named Janet Johnston, 
and a psychologist named Barry Brickham. I mentioned these to kind of explain that these are all people who separately, independently described parental alienation, and this was all back in the 1980s and 1990s. And since then, there have been hundreds of articles in professional journals throughout the world in which parental alienation has been described. So it is really wrong to say that parental alienation has not been published in professional journals and in peer-reviewed journals. And so we need to correct that, and we need to, to make it clear that it really has been described over and over again, uh, not just in newspapers or in magazines, but in professional journals and what we would describe as qualitative research or descriptive research. But in addition, um, there's quantitative research. The difference is that quantitative research is sometimes considered more scientific because it involves statistics and numbers and that kind of thing. Their, their parental alienation has also been studied quantitatively, and these uh, topics have been published. Uh, there's actually a good review chapter in a book that was published just a year ago, and the name of the chapter is called Empirical Studies of Alienation. And these authors, it's, it's a review chapter where they, they discuss a number of different studies all in one chapter. These, these authors found 59 quantitative research studies published in English uh, that talk about rural alienation. And they concluded that there are some aspects that have been studied very well, for instance, what are the eight symptoms of parental alienation that are commonly seen in children? That they concluded, these, this review article concluded, that that topic has been studied very well. Or what are the alienating behaviors? What are the things that a parent might do to cause parental alienation? These authors in the review article said that that has been studied very well. And I'll just give you an example of the kind of article they're talking about. There's a psychologist here in the United States in New York named Amy Baker, and she studied families in which parental alienation had occurred. And she studied the symptoms that the children had in these families. And she found that the eight symptoms that are commonly described in parental alienation were found in these families, either 90, 90 almost always 90% of the time. The symptoms are what are called the campaign of denigration, where the child complains about the other parent over and over again, and having weak reasons for the complaint, and having what's called lack of ambivalence, or splitting, where the child says one parent is totally good and the other parent is totally bad. Or the child um, has borrowed phrases, that is, one parent makes complaints about the other parent, and the child says the same thing. So what I'm trying to explain is that the basic symptoms of parental alienation have been found in quantitative research that I work with that is going to be published in uh, soon, in, at, at sometime in uh, 2018. And in that paper, we try to identify whether there's a test. Is there a test, like a questionnaire, that can be used to identify children who are alienated. And we found that there is. The name of the test is Parental Acceptance Rejection Questionnaire, which is called the PARQ, P-A-R-Q. And we found that if we gave that questionnaire to children who were alienated, and, and you can score the test mathematically, that the children who are alienated would say that one parent is really, really, really good and the other parent is really, really, really bad or evil. And that's abnormal. Normal children don't say that. The children who have alienation score that way on that questionnaire. So just to summarize, what I'm trying to show here is that the people who, who disclaim or who, or, who, or who say that parental alienation is not a serious thing are really mistaken. Because what I've tried to show here is, first of all, that parental alienation is really accepted by big and important professional organizations. 
and I mentioned 10 or 11 different organizations that have accepted the reality of rental alienation. And secondly, these people sometimes say that there's no research published in, in journals, and there really has. There's been research published in uh, hundreds of journals throughout the world. And then thirdly, sometimes people say, well, there's no quantitative research. There's no scientific research. And there really has. There have been dozens of uh, papers published uh, that are very solid and very, very important to know about. So I think that this type of uh, presentation helps to show that parental alienation really does exist, that it's being recognized by the uh, big societies, even by the World Health Organization, and that's, that it's an important thing to know about. And in order to help these children, we really have to be able to accept the reality of the problem and to be able to diagnose the problem in these children. So thank you for letting me participate in this meeting. And now my colleague in Slovakia, Dr. Joseph Tinka, is going to continue this discussion. Thank you for letting me do that. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Vargo, and today I will showcase a study. Can you hear me like this? Hello? So today I will showcase findings from a pilot study that we carried out in the Hampshire County. So I was uh, collaborating at Kingston University. Um, so I would like to showcase this, not only to present the findings, but also the methodology that we carried out, because I think it's interesting and it shows uh, the potentials. Before we get into the subject matter, um, I'll give you a bit of the story of what happened. So the Hampshire County contacted the research group at Kingston University because uh, they had, yeah, sorry. Um, they were interested in finding out about prevalence of drug use in their, um, in their region, in the county, especially among adolescents. So they were particularly concerned about legal highs as there was an increase in um, shops. So there was more shop, smart shops that were being opened. So they were concerned that young people were buying legal highs. Mm, the resulting study that we carried out was fruit of a compromise. So the first limitation that was encountered was exactly the normative approach that the policymakers were uh, proposing and also the ethical council. So the ethical council was concerned with us providing a list of drugs to these young people. So the compromise that we found, which is in line also with our theoretical background, was using uh, substance use categories. So we think this is relevant because till now researchers have tended to categorize drugs according to their legal status um, or their supposed dangerousness, but we find that it's more useful to categorize drugs according to their effect. This helps us not only get closer to the motivations be behind drug use, so we understand why people approach certain drugs rather than others, and it also helps us understand and predict drug trends. So um, we know, for example, that in the last 20 years, stimulants have become highly popular. And very often when some stimulants are unavailable on the market, for example, cocaine, um, users will approach other substances. So for example, there's many synthetic stimulants like mephedrone that can be used interchangeably. Now let's get into the subject matter of the study. So we adopted, we use a mixed methodological study. So the first phase was, um, collecting self-report survey. So we administered questionnaires during Rock Challenge. Rock Challenge is an event promoted by the Hampshire County to reduce drug use by addressing kids, getting them to get involved with the performative arts. So we had a cohort, quite large cohort, of young people that we already knew were not engaged in substance use. So as I mentioned earlier, we used two types of questionnaires, one for people that were younger than 16, where drugs weren't mentioned, but just drug categories, and another questionnaire that used uh, more explicit items in terms of, uh, of substance use. The second component of the study was uh, implicit association tests. 
which are used to explore um, subconscious attitudes, implicit attitudes. I'll give you more detail if you don't know about it later. And then finally, there was a qualitative component, uh, which were the many interviews. So the researcher, myself, uh, contacted, well, engaged with the students and with a non-judgmental attitude and requested the students to co-participate in the research study. So this helped us collect indirect information in terms of prevalence of uh, the drugs that were being used within the social context. Here's a brief overview of the social demographic data. So as I mentioned, it's blatant that the samples are extremely biased. So we have 83% female, Caucasian as well. Uh, but nonetheless, we still think that the information that was retrieved from the questionnaires was still relevant and well, should still be uh, taken with tweezers. So here we go. This is um, a list of uh, categories, of substance categories, and we asked the young people to describe how they felt confident, how, they, how knowledgeable they were in terms of the, the use of these substances. So what we see in the under, eight, under 16 cohorts is that, in general, young people uh, in this group did not have much understanding of substances, of mind-altering substances. We do see that there is a slight difference, a slight increase in terms of drinks that are psychoactive, that have mind-altering effects. So we're talking about alcohol and energetic drinks. When we look at the over 16 questionnaire, obviously, uh, as you can see from this chart, the data is quite different. So what we have is a cohort of people that feel that are quite knowledgeable in terms of substance use, especially the most commonly used psychoactive substances, alcohol and tobacco. As you can see, they feel that, they're, that they know a great deal about these substances, uh, most probably because by that age they have experimented with uh, binge drinking, smoking, etc. When we ask them if it was acceptable to use drugs for fun, this type of data is confirmed. So up to year 10, young people tend to think that it's not good to have fun with drugs. And then something changes around the age of 16. Drug use becomes um, more interesting and students tend to engage much more into it. So to understand this data, it's important to uh, sort of have an understanding of how the UK scholastic system is organized. So secondary school is divided into two components. So we have a, um, a first secondary phase where students hang around with younger kids up to the age of 16 and then they attend vocational colleges or other types of institutions that prepare them for university. So that, this means that adolescents under the age of 16 hang around with each other and then they're introduced to another world of older kids when they approach the second part of secondary school. We think this information is relevant because it gives us indications of when is the right time to, <clears throat> to start prevention. So when, when is the right time to talk about drugs with young people? In the case of the Hampshire County, we figure that it's best to keep this younger age group protected and perhaps approach drug use prevention at a later age, so during the vocational colleges and secondary schools. The situation could be different in other regions and other countries, so we know, for example, that in some contexts, young people engage in drug use at a much earlier age, so 12, 13, 14. What did we learn from the questionnaires in general? So we, did, uh, we had the opportunity to provide some reinsurances to the Hampshire County, so uh, we told them again that the younger cohort was relatively drug naive. We thought this was good news. Legal highs were definitely not prevalent, so students did, were not familiar with them, were not purchasing them, etc. And other types of mind-altering substances, such as cognitive enhancers or performance enhancers, were not used, and well, were they they did not know anything about them. In terms of uh, concerns, some issues arose. So we understand that poly drug use is prevalent, is common, is the norm. Alcohol drinking is uh, 
very often engaged in a very early age, starting from 12, 13. And most importantly, we understand that accessibility and availability of drugs is uh, preponderant. So these young people feel that if they want to engage in drug use, it's very simple to do so. Now, if we go into looking at the implicit association tests, we have some different uh, results. So what is an IET? An IET is a sorting test, so we ask the, the participant to play a game where they're requested to um, match target categories with attribute uh, categories. So fundamentally, we ask young people to match uh, bad adjectives with legal drugs or illegal drugs, and good adjectives with legal drugs or illegal drugs. We managed to administer 61 IATs, and this is uh, the result. So this is a distribution of the scores. The, so the scores obtainable range between two and minus two. And what we see here is that at least the people that uh, carried out the implicit associ association test had a moderately negative attitude towards illegal drugs. So they tend to prefer associating illeg illegal drugs with negative adjectives. This is a bit not in line with the normalization theory. The normalization theory supports that drug use is normalizing and is becoming part of integrated lifestyles. But we do see from this data that uh, that transgressive, negative representation of illegal drugs is still present in the cohort. Finally, we had a, a third phase, a third component of the mixed met uh, methodological study which consisted in carrying out these mini-interviews. So 71 ad adolescents were interviewed. Um, usually they were either interviewed individually or in small groups. And as I mentioned earlier, they, the, the students were requested to co-participate. So we would sit them down and explain to them the goals and objectives of the study and ask them to help us. So as we were expecting, no one admitted into using illicit substances. But they did admit that within their social context, drug use was common and, and preponderant. Drinking alcohol was considered the norm. So this was in all age settings, as I mentioned earlier. And what's important to underline is that uh, they often told us that it was the same parents that were purchasing alcoholic beverages for their children, for the parties, for their first parties. And, uh, well, we believe this is something to reflect upon. Again, during the interviews, it was evident that there is a jump, there is a gap between the under-16s and the over-16s, as um, for the over-16s, drug use was seen as a social adaptation uh, matter. It was about being cool. You must remember that from high school years. And that drinking and smoking, as one young female, age 15, told us, is a hierarchy thing. So we understand that it's, uh, it becomes a component of adulthood. So young people experiment with substances, whatever is available, to form, to forge their adult identity. When we asked them about which drugs their peers use, this is the ranking that came out. So we have obviously alcohol, cigarettes, cannabis, Etc. So there were some substances that surprised us. Number six, methadone, uh, because uh, according to general statistics, it's not quite commonly used, but it seems that there's a pocket of users within the Hampshire County. So methadone is a, used to be a legal high, and it was banned in 2010. And paradoxically, once it was banned, its use increased considerably. So this is something else to reflect upon. Uh, another substance that sort of surprised us, that jumped to us, was number nine laughing gas, also known as hippie crack. If we look at the ranking and the ranking of drugs that are most commonly used in the world, so this comes from Global Drug Survey, we see that there's quite a bit of similarity. So the lists are quite similar. This gives, provides us reassurance in terms of uh, the type of information that we retrieve. So we do, not, we do not expect our data to be considered representative, but it's definitely reliable. 
Now, I, I discussed mephedrone earlier. I'll, I'd like to give you some more details about nitrous oxide, so laughing gas, hippie crack, different names. So this substance is legal. It can be bought in different shops. It's very easy to access, and it's generally considered safe because it's also used uh, in um, child anesthesia. But what we understand is that drugs should not be considered per se for their psychotropic effects, but we should contextualize them sorry, in um, drugs in the setting and the set. So even if a drug is considered safe, if they're used inappropriately, they can be extremely dangerous. So in the case of laughing gas, we've had a case recently, I believe in the UK, of a girl who purchased for her personal consumption quite a bit of nitrous oxide, consumed it in the solitarity of her home, and uh, provided permanent nervous damage to herself. So it's definitely not safe. Also, the way that it's consumed can make a difference. So as you can see, this is a canister, and usually it's filled up, uh, they fill up a balloon, and then they in inhale from the balloon. But uh, what happens sometimes is that these young people do run out of balloons, and they'll tend to inhale directly from the canister. This is extremely dangerous. It can create permanent damage to the respiratory system. In terms of other substances, uh, the young people did not have any familiarity, again, with performance enhancers and uh, bodybuilding substances. So this was reassuring, and it's probably because um, these are activities that are probably are more interesting at a later age. So once these young people um, approach university and uh, higher education. Again, from the interviews, we understand that drugs are easily accessible, uh, they told us about drug dealers at school, drug dealers in their social contexts, parents buying uh, alcohol or cigarettes, and also the internet. So the internet has a preponderant role, and as um, drug use preventionists, we need to give it a central, uh, a pivotal uh, position within our activities. Conclusions. What did we understand? What did we learn from our pilot study? Well, firstly, we understood the importance of using different approaches. So instead of just using questionnaires, it's nice to use the mixed methods because we can integrate different sources of information that can overcome um, secretiveness, social desirability, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, we understood that it's extremely important to monitor closely substance use, especially novel trends because trends change very quickly in the contemporary world, thanks to the internet. And catching trends on time can help us provide, for example, harm reduction recommendations for people. So for example, in the case of nitrous, uh, nitrous oxide, we can enhance, well, uh, highlight the importance of using the substance appropriately, properly. And finally, the internet. So as I mentioned earlier, it's really important to understand how uh, central it is in determining drug use and drug initiation. So this is another chart that I picked up from Global Drug Survey. It has nothing to do with the data that we collected, but it shows the increase over the years of purchases on darknet markets of uh, illegal substances. So what I thought was interesting for you was, was to see that your neighboring countries, Hungary and, and uh, Austria, present uh, an increase, an important increase from 2015 to 2016 in the use of the dark net by drugs. It's expectable, I guess, to imagine that Slovaks might adopt, in the, same, might adopt the same behaviors. So I would like to thank uh, my different collaborators in helping me produce this presentation and also the data. And if you have questions that you might want to ask privately, go ahead and send me an email, follow me on Twitter, and please, if you have any questions, ask me now, as I think it would be interesting to start a discussion. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask about the implicit association test and uh, the result were true for which group, the under 16 or over 16 or mixed? Yes. So, um, yeah, let's go back to that. Yeah, 
so as I mentioned, uh, unfortunately, we were able to, yeah, so we were only able to uh, administer the IAT to 61, and there weren't enough to compare the differences between the younger and the older adults, but yes, definitely. So it's mixed. Yeah, it's mixed. So uh, yes, that would be something to do in future studies is analyze What would be interesting, a... like, if the 16 plus uh, adult uh, children uh, who are also users, if they have like a negative, implicit yeah. attitude, but still they use it. Yeah, of course. Um, if, you, if you can look in. Sure. Uh, well, unfortunately, yeah, I don't have any evidence to bring to sort of support my hypothesis, but uh, I do suspect that negative attitudes contribute to that transgress transgressive representation of drugs, of illicit drugs, which for some uh, theorists contributes to the development of addiction and uh, to those correlated problems. So, yeah, it's interesting to explore. On the one side, if you are a user, you probably may have a positive attitude, but on the implicit side, you can still have like a negative one. So yeah, well, there's been there has been studies that have demonstrated that people that have dysfunctional relationships with drugs, so for example, cocaine abusers, will have they will still have an, a negative implicit association towards cocaine. And it's suspected that this contributes, as I was mentioning earlier, to um, creating a sort of sick relationship with the drug because that's what the addict does. Um, the addict is constantly negotiating with his problem and uh, telling himself this is bad, but then repeating the conduct and this creates a vicious cycle. <laughs>